Okay, hello folks, I guess we can start now. So I would like to welcome you to this talk. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, so just before we start, a few short words about me, who I am. Uh, my name is Martin, I'm a software consultant and I have my own company called Coffee Cup Consulting. A little bit of a funny name. Uh, I'm also one of the guys who organizes the events of the Bulgarian Java User Group. We also have our own community conference called JFlyme. We, orga we organize it in May each year. And I'm also very fond of the Open JDK and Oracle database. Uh, so I do quite a lot of research around the Open JDK and the Oracle database. I'm also author of uh, the Learning Rabbit MQ book, which was published just at the beginning of the year. I just also have one copy here. And um, I'm also quite fond of messaging brokers. So if you have any questions in that area, you can also find me after the talk and ask me. And also, I'm currently writing a book on Java 9. As you know, the Java 9 release was delayed uh, with a few months, so it's expected in February next year. And the book basically covers uh, things like mo the, mo new, the new module system in the Java platform, or Project Jigsaw, along with other new stuff which we would expect in Java 9. Okay? And in this talk, so basically the, the purpose of this talk is to give you a short history of how does the Java security model evolve throughout the versions of the Java platform, along with the supporting KPIs which are provided in the JDK and that you can use uh, along with this security model. And at the end of the talk, we'll cover a few specific best practices that are related to the security model of the Java platform. Just before we start, how many of you know what a security manager in Java is? No one? Okay, so I think that would be good. Um, in, in this talk, you should learn what the security manager is. Okay, so first thing, evolution of the Java security model. I'll tell you a very brief story of how does the security model evolved throughout the versions of the Java platform. And in that way, we'll track and see how this model was developed uh, from the initial release of the Java platform up to JDK 9, and how basically uh, this model is adapted throughout the different versions of the Java platform. So traditionally, basically, companies have tried to protect their assets in any possible way. You know, when you start, for example, work in a new company or uh, you change your job, uh, you are obliged to read the security policy in many cases. And this security policy specifies how you should treat the assets of the company, both software or hardware, in order to make it uh, a secure, um, in order to make it a more secure um, company me uh, mechanism. So basically companies have tried to protect their assets by using tools such as intrusion protection systems, firewall, antivirus systems, intrusion detection systems, and so on and so forth. However, with the emergence of technologies that allowed you to execute source code from the browser, this means, for example, uh, applets, so you could use applets in order to do whatever you want from the browser. You can execute arbitrary code from the applet on the user's machine. And in that regard, a new, whole new set of security concerns emerged with uh, the emergence of these types of technologies. So how to deal with this? How basically can we address these type of security concerns? And this is one of the goals of the Java security sandbox model, to address the ability to specify a security sandbox model through which you can execute securely applications from managed systems. By managed systems, you can think of the, the browser that allows you to execute applets, Java application servers that allow you to execute applications, also, OSGI containers that allow you to manage and execute OSGI bundles and so on and so forth. So basically, this model is adapted for any type of managed system in the Java platform that allows you to execute uh, any type of application and to run arbitrary source code inside the platform. So here is it how it all started in version 1.0 of the Java platform. This was more than 20 years ago. So the original sandbox model was just very simple. We had two parts. We had uh, system code, which was deemed as trusted. This was basically all the source code of the JDK, and it had the permission to do whatever it wanted to do, to open a socket connection, to write to the file system, and everything. And you also had the untrusted domain, which were all of the applets that were executed externally inside the same browser. So basically a strict set of permissions were applied to all of the applets that were loaded in the browser. In this particular example, we will look at 
is uh, all of the applets that are loaded from the vox.com slash demo applet side. So in this particular case, all of them have the same set of permissions as of Java 1.0. And basically, as we mentioned, code is divided strictly into two domains, trusted and untrusted. The trusted domain was the source code of the JDK classes, and the untrusted domain was that of the applets that we loaded into the browser. So this was version 1.0. In version 1.1, however, uh, the guys at Sun at the time decided that this was not a very flexible model. So they wanted to introduce a way that you could specify that some of the applications you load in the browser are trusted. Meaning that, for example, the applications that are trusted can do whatever they want with the system. They can write to the file system, open a socket, and do whatever they want. And in that regard, in version 1.1, something called signed applets was introduced meaning that now with, uh, there was a mechanism that allowed you to specify that a specific set of the applets you load are deemed as trusted, and they can do the same things as the JDK source files. Okay. Uh, so now we had basically uh, still the same model, trusted and untrusted source code, and the untrusted source code was now basically from applets that were not signed. The trusted source code was from uh, the JDK platform and from signed applets. And this is the very short process of how you can sign an applet in order to make it trusted. So first you need to compile the source code of the applet, then you need to create a jar file in a very usual manner. Then you need to generate a pair of public private keys and after that you need to sign the jar file with the private key. Apart from that you need to export public key for uh, public key along with the certificate and then you you need to import that certificate in the trusted store of the running JDK platform. After that, you need to create a policy file that specifies what permissions do your trusted applications have, for example, and what permissions do your trusted applets have uh, in the uh, currently running JDK. And finally, you need it to load and run the applet. So this was very briefly the process of how you can sign and execute a trusted applet. And you can use this mechanism even now in version 1.8 of the Java platform. In version 1.2, however, there was, there was a radical change in the security model of the Java platform. So this notion of trusted and untrusted source code was not very flexible, actually. It didn't allow you to specify a particular set of permissions for a particular application. And in version 1.2, there was really a radical change in the security model of the Java platform, and that was the introduction of the so-called security manager and access controller classes. So basically, you can think of the security manager and access controller APIs as the same thing, but the fact is that actually the security manager uses the access controller class behind the scenes. So now in version 1.2, the guys at Sun decided that you need a flexible model that allowed you to specify a particular set of permissions for a particular set of applications. And that was established by means of the so-called security.policy file. So you know, there is a security.policy file that comes by default with the installation of the JDK. And it has a very specific uh, domain-specific language that allows you to specify permissions. Uh, in the example here, uh, this is a snippet from a security policy file. And what I say is grant code base, uh, voxdays.com slash demo applet, permission, Java I.O. file permissions, see Windows delete. This means that I grant all of the applets loaded from the vox.com site to have the permission to delete the C Windows folder. And this is basically the syntax that you can use in order to specify permissions. So basically, uh, a permission line has three things. The type of the permission, in this particular case, this is java.io.file permission. Uh, the, the target of the uh, permission, this is the C Windows folder, and the action, in this particular case, this is delete. So we have three specific things that we need to specify when, you def when we define a permission for a particular uh, application or set of applications. So now the security model becomes more code-centric as of Java 1.2. You now don't have trusted and untrusted domain, but now you rather you specify which code base, which is the location of where you loaded your applet from, or any other type of managed application, uh, you specify a particular set of permissions that apply to that particular location. And also, all of these decisions, security decisions, are made in a security.policy file, as we saw in the previous slide. However, 
now that there is no trusted and untrusted domain, there was another term which, which was introduced in the Java platform, and that was the term of protection domain. How many of you have heard of protection domains? Okay, no one? So protection domain essentially uh, is the set of permissions for a particular code base. So this is the location of where you load your applets from and the set of permissions that applies to, do, to those applets. Basically, the protection domain of a particular Java class is set during class loading, as we shall see in just a few slides. So now we had two types of protection domains as of version 1.2. These are the system and the application protection domains, meaning that the JDK sources was, were deemed as uh, system protection domain, and the, all of the applications were in the uh, application protection domain. And basically, you can retrieve a protection domain of a particular Java class by calling applet, for example, this could be any type of instance. Uh, so we can say instance.getClass.getProtection domain. And this gives you a protection domain instance which you can use to check what type of permissions does a particular class have and what is the location from where that class is loaded from. So you can imagine that this class is loaded from a jar file or from an applet or any other place and you can retrieve that location by retrieving the protection domain of the class. Also out of the protection domain, you can retrieve the set of permissions for that class. And one interesting property of permissions as of version 1.2 is that one permission can imply another permission. So for example, if I specify that I have the permission to delete the C Windows folder, this automatically means that I also have the permission to delete the C Windows system 32 folder. Uh, and this is a very nice property that allows you to, to encapsulate a bigger set of permissions when you define them in the security policy file. Another interesting property of Java permissions is that the location of where you load your applications from can imply another location. So in this particular case, this means that if I specify a code base of vox.com, this means that this implies the code base vox.com slash demo applet. So this means that basically I can apply one location of source code from another. There is an interesting property as well. So for example, you have a Java E application server and you load one or more WAR files in that application server. The Java application server has one particular set of permissions and the WAR file, as it is loaded from another location, has a different set of permissions. So now you can think of what is, in that case, the, the, the set of permissions for the WAR file as the execution of the code from the WAR file passes through the application server as well? And an interesting property of permissions is that actually the set of permissions for a, uh, for a particular executing thread is considered to be the intersection of permissions of all of the protection domains that this thread passes through. This means that, for example, if we have a thread that executes inside our WAR file, it has a protection domain which is the intersection of the permissions of the WAR file and the permissions of the Java application server. Okay, moving toward version 1.3 and 1.4 of the Java platform, um, a new thing called JAS was introduced. Do you know what JAS is? Anyone? Yeah? What is JAS? Yes. Correct. Yes, exactly. So, and you get a book. You can take it after the talk. <laughs> so Java is Java Authentication and Authorization Service. And basically in version 1.3, it was decided that there was no way to specify who is executing the source code. There was no way to identify the user. The set of permissions of up to version 1.2 of the Java platform was identified only based on the code base uh, of the class. And now in version 1.3, there was another mechanism introduced that allowed you to specify also the user or some properties of the user that executed the source code. Now the policy, the, the specific language of the Java security policy file was extended. And in this particular example, we, we say as part of the security policy file, grant principle, and this is some LDAP principle, X500 principle, which has a name of Tom, the ability to delete the C Windows folder. A principle means some attribute of the user. This could be the email address, some specific property related to the fact of where that user is loaded from and so on and so forth. So now as you can see, I can specify permissions based also on some property of the user 
that currently executes the source code. And how this basically happens, we'll see in just a few seconds. Uh, so, yeah, so Java basically has two particular things. One is the authentication model, and the other is the authorization model. And in particular, basically, it's the uh, authorization model that extends the Java security model, and the authentication model can be used independently. It can be used as part of a Java e application, it can be used as part of a Java standard edition application, and so on and so forth. So basically, just extends the security model of the Java platform with the ability to specify role-based permissions. And no, now also the protection domain of the class contains not only the location of your class and the set of permissions, but also a list of principles, which is the list of attributes of the user that executes the, the source code, meaning that this could be an email address, username, and so on and so forth. Uh, and also the authentication component of JAS is based on the uh, idea behind pluggable authentication modules, meaning that you can establish different mechanisms for authenticating the user using either an LDAP server, a relational database, Kerberos protocol, and so on and so forth. And also the authorization component, as we saw in the previous slide, is the one that actually extends the security policy file of the Java platform. And here are the core classes of JAS. We'll describe them very briefly. Everything starts with the so-called logging context, which is used to create, uh, uh, to provide a mechanism for logging users inside your system. So in case you want to use JAS in your application, you will, you'll need to write your own JAS configuration along with uh, your own custom logic for logging in a user to the application. So you use a logging context in order to log in a user in one or more login modules. So login modules are, you can implement either your own login modules to authenticate a user, or the Java platform has a few predefined login modules, such as one for LDAP, for logging through Kerberos, and so on and so forth. When you log in a user, a subject instance that represents the logged in user is created, and that subject instance has one or more principles that identify the properties of the user, such as email address, and so on and so forth. So these are the core classes behind JAS. And now let's track what's the current sec um, security mechanism flow in up to version 1.4 as we saw it. So initially when an application starts up, for example, this could be Java in the browser or Java E application server, it installs a, an instance of the security manager by calling system.setSecurityManager and passing an instance of the security manager. It also sets some particular security policy. By default, the mechanism used by the Java platform is that is with the security policy files, but you can also use a custom mechanism, for example, specifying, let's say, permissions in a relational database table. So you also need to specify what is the security policy that you'll be using by calling policy.set policy. Also, when you install a security manager and specify the security policy, you start loading your classes, your application classes, with some class loaders. As you know, the Java application server model uses a separate module class loaders for loading of, uh, of different types of applications. And during class loading, bytecode verification is done. And also the protection domain of the classes that are loaded is set, meaning that uh, that protection domain contains the source code of where your classes are loaded from, it contains the set of permissions specified in the security policy file and possibly a set of just principles depending on whether you have authenticated your user or not in the application. Also, when system code is, invo is invoked, uh, the security manager instance that you have installed as part of step one is used to check whether you have the, uh, the ability to do something uh, with uh, your application. So basically, as the threads of your application intersect uh, different protection domains, the security manager is used to check whether the call stack of the currently executing thread has the permission to do something. And here is how permission checking is being done. So we create an instance of your particular permission. For example, let's say we have a socket permission. So we create a socket permission to check whether we have the ability to open or listen for socket connections uh, between ports 8,000 and 9,000 on the vox.com site. So when we create that particular permission instance, 
we check whether we have a security manager instance installed. And we, we don't have a security manager instance if it's null. And we, if we have a security manager instance, we say security manager dot check permission and specifying that permission. This line here basically takes the currently executing thread stack trace and checks for all of the permissions of the classes in that stack, tra stack trace whether they have the ability to do to open a socket connection on this side using these ports. So basically throughout the JDK platform there are a, lo a lot of places where you can see this particular piece of source code or when you uh, look at for example the source code code of a Java E application server, there are also a lot of places where this permission checking is being done. This is particularly necessary for applications that allow you to execute source code remotely. For example, you have uh, JDK running in the browser, or you have a Java E application server, all of them need to do this permission checking in order to ensure that the applications that they run have part the particular permission. Of course, another important thing is that by default when you write a Java application, you don't have a security manager installed. Meaning that your application can do whatever you want with uh, the system. Basically, you can write files using the file output stream and so on and so forth. And when you, for example, try to write to a file, no permission checking is being done. As by default, there is no security manager instance installed. Also, when permission checking is being done, as we mentioned, application can also invoke similar snippet of code in order to do whether they have some, uh, some permission is currently active. So basically applications can also do permission checking. For example, if that's a Java application to server, it, it is mandatory that it makes some permission checks at some particular points in the managed services, for example, of the Java application server. Also, we can use the access controller class to do the same thing. So basically, as you can see, we can create a socket permission in the same manner, and we can use the static methods provided by the access controller class. As we mentioned, access controller basically does the same thing as the security manager class, but you don't need a security manager instance installed as part of your application. You can use the static methods provided by the access controller class to do the permission checking. Also, at some points in time, you may need to do privilege escalations. For example, Consider the following case. You have a WAR file, and that WAR file needs to use uh, a logger service provided by the Java e application server. The application, the WAR file, doesn't have the permission to write to the file system, but the application server has the permission to write to the file system. As you intersect the two protection domains, this means that your WAR file doesn't have the ability to write to the file system, and hence it cannot write to a log file in the application server. For that reason, the application server needs to wrap the particular piece of code of that service in the so-called uh, escalated privileged block of code, which allows basically applications to write to the log file without checking for their permissions. And this can be established by means of the do privileged method of the access controller class. And there are also two other APIs that allow you to change the user that currently executes the application you can say subject.doers and specify another subject instance that uh, currently runs the application. So in that way you can switch the current user of the application. And also you can do the same thing as with subject.doers privileged and change the user and also escalate the privileges of that user. And also the security manager API as we describe it can be customized. There is an interesting case for example with the Oracle database. You can write Java stored procedures inside Oracle database, and it runs inside the Java virtual machine, which runs inside the database. However, in order to do the permission checking, the Oracle database uses a custom security manager that looks for permissions inside of a relational database table. So as you can see, for example, Oracle database uses a custom implementation of that security model, and you can also implement your own security model uh, on top of these APIs provided by the JDK, but it could be a little bit error prone. So for example, if you um, implement it, it's not so trivial as you can have some security loopholes inside your uh, implementation of a custom policy mechanism or a custom security manager. So it's not that trivial. So moving towards version 1.5 and 1.6 of the JDK platform, there are no 
uh, radical changes in that security model. There is still the uh, sandbox model that uses the security major or the access controller classes. However, there is some enhanced support, for example, for LDAP. And there are some other minor changes introduced in those two releases. In version 1.7 and 1.8, still no major changes to that security model. And there's, there are some changes, for example, as uh, an overridden version of the do privileged method that allowed you to specify only a particular subset of permissions against you can check for, for uh, active permissions. So, yeah, as you can see, no major changes in, in that regard. In version 1.9, or JDK 9, that we expect next year, however, this, basically the same security model still applies. How many of you have heard of Project Jigsaw? Yeah, a couple of people. So basically, as you know, Project Jigsaw allows you to uh, define a module system uh, at compile time in terms of the Java platform. And basically, the source code of the JDK, which contains more than 5,000 Java classes, is split into different modules, for example, JAXP, CORBA, and so on and so forth. And also, application developers are given the ability to create their own Java modules that they can either install as part of the JDK platform, or they can uh, use at compile time using the so-called module path, which is very similar to the notion of class path where you specify all of the dependencies of your application. So in terms of Jigsaw modules, each module can be loaded from a different location, from the file system, remotely, and so on and so forth. And basically modules, as defined by Project Jigsaw, use the same class loading mechanism as it was, as you know it, with the bootstrap extension and system class loaders. This means basically that the security model as we saw it now applies to Jigsaw modules intact, meaning that there are no changes in regard to the security model along with the module system introduced in JDK 1.9. Each module will have a particular uh, location from where it's loaded. It will have permissions defined in a security policy file pretty much similar to what we do with, uh, for example, applets. And it will also use JAS in the same way as uh, it was used with uh, different types of applications. Um, yeah, we mentioned about modules and yeah, no, no, still no, no particular changes. So this was basically the security model of the Java platform. Along with that security model, however, we have a spe specific set of uh, APIs or libraries that we can use in order to establish different security aspects of our applications. And this is the other side of the coin that we'll look into very briefly, or the set of APIs that contribute to that security model. And very briefly, this is the list of APIs provided by the JDK that you can use. Uh, these are the Java cryptography architecture, the public infrastructure utilities that allow you to create your own public infrastructure with issuing certificates, uh, doing certificate revocations, and so on and so forth. You also have the secure socket extension, which is an extension of the standard Java sockets uh, over SSL. We have an alternative API of uh, Java Secure Sockets, which is called Java Generic Security Services, or the Java GSS API. And we also have the Java Simple Authentication and Security Layer, which allows us to exchange security information between a client and the server application. For example, it allows you to negotiate how will the client application authenticate against the server application, whether, whether it will use an email address or whether it will use an email and along with the password. Let's look very briefly at each of those APIs. So the Java cryptography architecture provides different utilities, for example, for creating message digest, for creating digital signatures, and so on and so forth. Basically, the API itself doesn't provide any algorithms for doing this. It's just uh, an API. And there are some different implementations that can be plugged in that API and installed as part of the JDK. There is a very famous library that maybe some of you have used. It's called the Java Bouncy Castle library, which provides implementation for a lot of the uh, APIs of the Java cryptography uh, architecture. Also, um, JCA is not only pluggable, but it's, as we mentioned, it's independent from particular crypto cryptographic algorithms. And this API continues to evolve. And basically, the way that this API continues to evolve is with the support for stronger cryptographic algorithms, 
which are provided by different libraries, and also with um, more sets of utilities that are provided uh, as part of these libraries. Also, the PKI utilities provide you with mechanism for working with certificates. There is, there is the ability to install a certificate. For example, you know there is a Java Trust store which allows you to store some certificate information. Also, the PKI utilities provide you with the mechanism to use the so-called OCSP protocol, which is a protocol that allows you to revoke a certificate and to check whether that certificate is valid or not. And also to manage certificates, as we mentioned, in key stores and trust stores inside the JDK. And as a brief recap, this is how basically certificate revocation works and how you can establish it with the JDK utilities. Uh, you have your own certificate authority that you can establish uh, with the PKI utilities of the JDK platform. And that certificate authority can publish information about valid certificates either in the so-called certificate revocation list or through the OCSP protocol. And when you check whether your certificate is valid from your applications, you can use any of those two mechanisms. Basically, the PKI utilities uh, in the Java platform also continue to evolve. And that's in terms of basically the support they provide for storing and managing certificates and keys and supporting the newer versions of the PKI-related uh, standards. Also, the GSS API, which we uh, mentioned, this is an extension of the standard Java socket, sockets as you know them over SSL. And also, the Java Secure Socket Extension API continues to evolve, for example, with the support to specify the so-called uh, server name identification. You can think of server name identification as a virtual separation of different virtual servers uh, inside the same secure socket server. Uh, and this allows you to provide some way of separating different client connections to the server in terms of virtual domains. Also the Java GSS API. As we mentioned, this is an alternative of uh, Java secure sockets, but it works differently. The way it works is that you exchange security information between the client and the server by means of so-called security tokens by which you exchange that information instead of establishing a secure socket connection. So the GSS API is also independent of any underlying protocol that you can use it to establish that token-based security communication. Also, the GSS API can be used along with JAS for authenticating a client against the server. And the GSS API continues also to evolve in terms of the support it provides for more protocols. So one example of this is that um, support is provided for newer versions of the Kerberos protocol for authentication. Also, the Java SASL API, or Simple Authentication Service Layer, is a mechanism that allows you to exchange security information between the client and the server. The SASL API allows you to say, for example, uh, the, the following. Uh, the client asks the server, hey, can I authenticate using an email address and a password? The server replies by saying, yes, you can do this. Let's establish a secure communication channel and use that authentication mechanism. So the SASL, SASL API is a pluggable framework that allows you to define how to exchange security information between the client and the server. And the SASL API also continues to evolve, especially in terms of support for more different types of properties that can be used in order to exchange that security information between the client and the server. And now, considering that we already know what is the security sandbox model of the Java API and the supporting libraries as we saw them, let's see some several uh, good practices that you need to be aware of when you use uh, those, those APIs or the sandbox model. In general, most of the security guidelines that you see here and there are not related to the Java platform, for example. In many places you read that you need to avoid, for example, SQL injection by sanitizing your SQL queries, or you need to, for example, think of type safety and error handling. All of these things are not specific to the Java platform. However, there are some things that are pretty specific to the Java platform, and for example, uh, one of these is uh, respect the security manager. This means that you need to design libraries that are aware of the fact that they can run in a managed environment such as a Java E application server or a NoSGI container which has a security manager instance installed. Let me give you a particular example of this. I had a case in my practice where I had to use the JSON, Google's JSON library, which allows you to marshal and unmarshal JSON. 
inside an OSGI container. So I edit the library as a dependency to my OSGI bundle, and I try to use that bundle inside the OSGI container. And what happened was that I received a security exception, which was very interesting to me because I just included uh, the JSON library as a dependency. And the reason for this was that basically the JSON library was using reflective APIs to do the unmarshalling of the JSON. And the security manager installed as part of the OSGI container didn't allow me to basically use that, that type of reflective APIs. So why, what I had to do basically was that I had to patch the JSON library to include the do privileged calls inside the source code of the JSON library meaning that the, the, secure, the, the um, server that was executing that library would just skip that permission checking of the reflective APIs and would allow me to do whatever the JSON library wants to do with these reflective APIs. So as you can see, that particular case, the JSON library was not implemented in a way to respect the security manager, preventing it from being used directly in a managed environment such as OSGI. Uh, also another interesting uh, thing to remember is that you need to grant the minimal set of permissions to your applications. Uh, there are some occasions where you can get a security exception in, or, in order to avoid this, you just specify all permissions to, to your application. As you can think, this is not really a good thing because uh, you can open some security flaws inside your application. So it's a very good practice that you specify only the minimal set of permissions that your application needs uh, in order to do the job it wants to do. And also one thing, another thing in that regard is copy pasting may replicate also security flows inside your application. So one of the, that's one of the reasons you need to avoid copy pasting in terms of security. Another interesting thing is that you also need to be very careful when you show exception stack traces to the users. So uh, you may think that this is not really a useful information, but in fact this gives a lot of information about your application. So when you show a stack trace of 200 lines of code to, to the users, that actually gives a lot of valuable information about, uh, about your source code. So you need to be careful when you, what you show to the users. You always need to sanitize and avoid showing stack traces to the users of your system. So that was it. Thank you for your attention. Now, Any, any questions in that to the sandbox model and the security APIs? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 No changes, basically, to, to the security manager. So, uh, when you, for example, wrap the, the particular parts of the application that use reflective APIs with these do privileged calls, and you install that library inside the application server. The, app the application server is able to skip the permissions of the OSGI bundle, which didn't allow it to, to use reflective APIs, and in that regard, you could use the library inside the OSGI container. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? No, if no, then thank you for your talk, for your attention.